At 42, she had spent her entire adult life locked in a basement cellar and used as a sex slave by her own father, who raped her over 3,000 times and fathered seven of her children, one of whom even died due to neglect. This is the story of Elizabeth Fritzel that shocked the whole world. The horrific story unfolded in 2008 in a small Austrian town and inspired a hit US movie. But the true story of Elizabeth and her surviving six children is far more chilling than any fiction could ever be. With a warning of adults and triggering content ahead, we take you through the frightening events of this case in this video. Let us start the story with some background on Elizabeth's father, the Austrian pensioner, Joseph Fritzl. He was an oppressive patriarchal figure in the family, and the fact that his daughter wanted to go out with friends, party, kiss her boyfriends, and live her life bothered him to such an extent that he eventually used criminal means to put chains around her. Joseph's grandfather had been married to a woman who couldn't conceive children. Because of this, the grandfather would have affairs with other women and then coerce his wife into adopting the children they bore. Yosef's mother was one of those children whom a trial lawyer described as unloving and sadistic. It's common that child abusers have often suffered child abuse themselves, and the people who mistreat others have often been treated in various ways themselves. This is no excuse or justification for the monstrous acts of Yosef, but just speculation on what could have triggered his descent into pure evil. Monsters are not created overnight. They are bred and fed over the generations. With that in mind, let us look at what happened to Elizabeth Fritzl during those 24 years in the basement and how it all began. On August 28, 1984, 18-year-old Elizabeth Fritzl went missing. Frantic over the whereabouts of her daughter, Rosemary hastily filed a missing persons report. For weeks, there was no word from Elizabeth, and her parents were left to assume the worst. Then out of nowhere, a letter arrived from Elizabeth claiming that she had grown tired of her family life and ran away. Her father, Joseph, told the policeman who came to the house that he had no idea where she would go. He told the police that she had most likely joined a religious cult, something she had talked about previously. But the truth was that Joseph Fritzl knew exactly where his daughter was. She was about 20 feet below where the police office was standing. Elizabeth was a girl full of dreams and aspirations, and she grew tired of her father consistently imposing harsh restrictions on her. She had previously expressed to her mother and her sister about her interest in leaving the family, traveling around the country, and starting a new life on her own as soon as she turned 18. Yosef overheard this conversation and decided to do something about it. On August 28, 1984, Yosef called his daughter into the basement of the family's home. He was refitting a door to the newly renovated cellar and needed help carrying it. As Elizabeth held the door, Yosef fixed it into place. As soon as it was on the hinges, he swung it open, forcing Elizabeth inside and knocking her unconscious with an ether-soaked towel. For the next 24 years, the inside of the dirt-walled cellar would be the only thing Elizabeth Fritzl would see. Her father would lie to her mother and the police, feeding them stories about how she had run away and joined a cult. Eventually, the police investigation into her whereabouts would run cold, and for a long time, the world would forget about the missing Fritzl girl. But Joseph Fritzl wouldn't forget, and over the next 24 years, he would make that very clear to his daughter. For the rest of the Fritzl family, Yosef was a hard-working husband and father, thoroughly dedicated to his career. For them, he would head down to the basement every morning at 9 a.m. to draw plans for the jeans that he sold. And occasionally, he would spend the night there. Joseph's wife never doubted the actions or intentions of her husband since she didn't know what disgusting acts were happening right beneath her feet. At the minimum, Joseph would visit his daughter in the basement three times a week, usually every day. For the first two years, he left her alone in captivity. Then he began to rape her, continuing the nightly visits he had begun when she had not even entered the adult phase of her life. Two years into her captivity, Elizabeth became pregnant and miscarried ten weeks into the pregnancy. Two years later, she fell pregnant again, this time carrying to term. In August of 1988, a baby girl named Kirsten was born, and two years later, she gave birth to another baby boy named Stefan. Kirsten and Stefan remained in the cellar with their mother for the duration of her imprisonment, and Joseph brought weekly rations of food and water for them. Elizabeth attempted to teach them with the rudimentary education she herself had and gave them the most normal life she could under terrific circumstances. 
Over the next 24 years, Elizabeth Fritzel gave birth to five more children. Point one more was allowed to remain in the basement with her. One died shortly after birth, and the other three were taken upstairs to live with Rosemary and Joseph. In order to conceal what he was doing from Rosemary, he staged elaborate discoveries of the children. He often placed them on bushes near the home or sometimes on the doorstep. Each time, the child was swaddled neatly and accompanied by a note allegedly written by Sabbath claiming that she couldn't take care of the baby and was leaving it with her parents for safekeeping. Shockingly, social services never questioned the appearance of the children and allowed the Fritz cells to keep them as their own children. Officials, on the other hand, remained under the impression that Rosemary and Joseph were the baby's grandparents. It is not known for how long Joseph Fritzel intended to keep his daughter captive in his basement. He had gotten away with it for 24 years. And for all the police knew, he was going to continue probably for another 24. However, in 2008, one of the children in the cellar fell ill. Elizabeth begged her father to allow her 19-year-old daughter Kirsten to get medical attention. She had fallen rapidly and critically ill, and Elizabeth was beside herself. Grudgingly, Joseph agreed to take her to a hospital. He removed Kirsten from the cellar and called an ambulance, claiming that he had a note from Kristen's mother explaining her condition. The police eventually grew suspicious of Joseph and reopened the investigation into Elizabeth Fritzel's disappearance. They began to read the letters that Elizabeth had supposedly been leaving for the Fritzels and began to see inconsistencies in them. Police questioned Kirsten and also asked the public for any information on her family. Naturally, no one came forward as there was no family to speak of. Whether Joseph finally felt pressure or had a change of heart regarding his daughter's captivity, the world may never know. But on April 26, 2008, he released Elizabeth from the cellar for the first time in 24 years. She immediately went to the hospital to see her daughter, where hospital staff alerted police to her suspicious arrival. That night, she was taken into custody to be questioned about her daughter's illness and her father's story. After making the police promise that she never had to see her father again, Elizabeth Fritzel told the tale of her 24-year imprisonment. She explained that her father kept her in the basement and that she bore his seven children. She explained that Joseph was the father of all seven of them and that Joseph Fritzel would come down during the night, make her watch pornographic films, and then rape her. She explained that he had been abusing her ever since she was 11. The police arrested Joseph Fritzel that very same night. After the arrest, the children in the cellar were also released and Rosemary Fritzel fled the home. She had allegedly known nothing about the events taking place right under her feet, and Joseph backed up her story. The tenants who had lived in the apartment on the first floor of the Fritzel home also never knew what was happening right beneath them. As Sio Seth had explained away all the sounds by blaming faulty piping and a noisy heater. Prior to his trial, Joseph confessed to the repeated rapes, claiming that the rape of his daughter was an addiction and the redirection of incestuous feelings he felt towards his own mother. He also claimed to be a loving, attentive father to the children he sired in the basement, bringing them books and stuffed animals, watching videos, and eating dinner with the children just like a family. At the trial, the father admitted guilt on an incest charge, but pleaded innocent to enslavement and to the murder of his child. After he saw Elizabeth's Tate testimony, he changed his plea to full guilt, acknowledging that his failure to care for medical care for the newborn may have directly contributed to the death. For his crimes, Fritzel was found guilty on all counts. Negligent murder, enslavement, incest, rape, coercion, and false imprisonment. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2009. He has been in solitary confinement in Austria's Kremlin prison since that time. According to Austrian media, he now suffers from dementia, and none of his family has visited during his decade behind bars. Today, Elizabeth Fritzel lives under a new identity in a secret Austrian village known only as Village Acts. The home is under constant CCTV surveillance and police patrol every corner. The family doesn't allow interviews anywhere within their walls and has declined to give any information about themselves. Though she is now in her mid-50s, the last photo taken of her was when she was just 16 years of age. How do you form an intimate relationship after the people who are supposed to protect you have done so many horrible things to you? What do you guys think? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. This is the story of 9-year-old Marie Shirella and her family. 
The tragic story began on the morning of March 18, 1964. Marisha Varela, a quiet girl from Hazleton, Pennsylvania, enjoyed playing the organ and aspired to be a nun. One day, she set out to bring some canned goods to her teacher at St. Joseph's Parochial School. She then later planned to attend the morning mass. But Shavarella never made it back. She was last seen walking east on West 4th Street at 8.10 a.m. Reports claim that on the cold morning of March 18th, while Maurice was on her way back to the school, she was asked by the neighbors to come up and get warm. But Maurice refused as she had to get back to her teacher with the goods. Neither the neighbors nor Maurice could have anticipated that from that moment, Maurice and her obedience would be history for the next five and a half decades. Somewhere along her way, she crossed paths with evil at approximately 1 p.m. the same day. A man noticed what looked like a large doll in a coal mining waste pit. When he looked closely, the doll was actually Marie Chivarella. Her body was discovered north of Route 309 in Hazel Township close to the Hazelton Airport. The investigation revealed Maurice was physically and sexually assaulted, murdered, and left at the scene with all her clothing and personal belongings. Before dumping her in a coal mining waste pit, the killer bound, gagged, raped, and strangled her. The discovery of her body shocked the entire Hazelton community. It was a heartbreak that was felt by everyone in the town, especially by the children. Children who were Morris's age started to be afraid while they were alone or unescorted. The case changed the way people lived and how they approached their children's safety in the town. It didn't take long for the Pennsylvania State Police to begin their investigative efforts, which would ultimately last for decades. The authorities did not know that in this case, to even get a lead to work on, it would take years of grinding and scanning through databases. There were no lead suspects immediately after the killing. The police could not retrieve any useful evidence from Morris's body that could lead them to her killer. They had no idea that it would take them over 50 years to find a single lead in 2007. Investigators were able to develop a DNA profile of the suspect from fluids left on Chevalis jacket, but the DNA didn't match any criminals in their system. They checked the database monthly against all other criminals that had DNA in the system, but there was no successful match. Then in 2019, police tried a different approach and uploaded DNA from Shavar Alice Jacket to the genealogical database. This time, there was a match, but to what appeared to be a very distant relative. The DNA match was insufficient to get the relative into custody or charge him with murder. To generate public interest and garner leads in the case, in 2018, Pennsylvania State Police used technology provided by Paraben Nano Labs to generate a snapshot phenotype facial prediction of the suspect from his DNA. The technology generated possible photos of the suspect at 25, 40, and 60. The pictures generated were released in the public domain. Unfortunately, no witnesses came out with any leads that could lead to Morris's killer. This was at a time when even Morris's parents had died. They did not live enough to see what would unfold in Morris's mystery ahead. Her siblings had said that her parents never sought revenge or punishment for their daughter's killer. They just wanted justice, but they did not make it alive to the other end of this investigation. Finally, in 2020, the police got help from an unlikely source. An 18-year-old named Eric Schubert emailed the department and offered to build out a family tree. He had volunteered with other cold cases before, and police accepted his help since Eric was known as a hard-working boy and a genius genealogy wizard. Schubert identified a number of family members, many of whom voluntarily shared their DNA with the police. The family tree eventually led the police to Moore Chivarella's killer, James Paul Fort. Fort was 22 years of age back then, and he had a criminal history of sexual assaults prior to Chivalous killing. A lot of emotions surfaced as state police announced they now know who killed a nine-year-old girl back in 1964. Unfortunately, police could not prosecute Fort because he had already died in 1980, and the cause of his death had been a heart attack. Police exhumed his body in January 2022. They found out a month later that his DNA was a match to the fluids left on Shavar's jacket. This information was released to the press in a press conference by Pennsylvania police, which left for more than an hour for Chivarella's surviving family. The news was bittersweet. Her sister Carmen Marie Radke stated that their family will always feel the emptiness and the sorrow of Marissa's absence. 
She added further that they will continue to ask themselves what would have been or could have been on that fateful day. Her family also went ahead and praised the persistent effort of Pennsylvania State Police because now they have gotten closure and a sense of being at peace with Morris's murder and the determination of the Pennsylvania police to solve this case was applaudable. They left no stone unturned to find out who the killer was, and this was also a success story of a 19-year-old Eric Schubert, who utilized his genius for very right purposes. But the question here still remains. After five and a half decades into the investigation, when the killer was already buried in his grave, was justice actually served to Maurice and her family? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. This is the story of Paulette Gebra Farah. It's every parent's worst nightmare to put their child to sleep at night and then find them vanish before daybreak. Well, that's exactly what happened to Paulette Gebra Farah. The worst part was that she was unexpectedly found between something no one ever thought about. Paulette Gebra Farah was four years old when she disappeared from her house on March 22, 2010. The case became prominent because she lived in one of the most upscale neighborhoods in Mexico, he was Kalukin. She had recently returned from a trip with her father, Mauricio Gubera, and sister. But her mother, Lizette Farah, had gone on a trip with her friend, Amanda de la Rosa, her lover, and multiple other men. Suspicions of her infidelity made Lizette the prime suspect in the case. The case became even more complicated when the family and two housekeepers provided inconsistent statements to the authorities. Paulette was born with both a physical disability and a language disorder and had two nannies who helped care for her, Erica and Martha Casimiro. The family was considered relatively affluent. Paulette's father, Morisha Gubera, worked in real estate while her mom, Lizette Farah, was an attorney. One evening in 2010, Lizette claimed she had put her little girl to bed as normal, but when her nanny Erica came into her room the next morning, the little girl was nowhere to be seen. There were no signs of forced entry into the house or any indication that a struggle had taken place. The CCTV cameras surrounding the property where Paulette Gubra Farah lived failed to show either when the child was leaving or being taken. The house had two family dogs that never made any noise during the night either. Where could the four-year-old have gone without a single trace? This story quickly turned into a media frenzy. Flyers were posted, billboards were erected, and ads were all over the TV and on public transport. Lizette even made a public plea on television for her daughter's abductor to come forward. The search sparked a great deal of public interest, but soon, many started placing the blame on Paulette's parents. The local community all came together to search for Paulette, but nothing was found. Albert Buzzbuzz, the Attorney General of the state, became involved and launched what would become a huge nine-day intensive search investigation. His involvement became the initial controversy. Many children are said to be reported missing in Mexico, but it wasn't until Paulette Gubra Farah, from a richer family, went missing that authorities put all their resources into finding her. Ultimately, police were baffled and found it very difficult to find the lead. What followed was the huge nine-day search with the community coming together to begin a tireless hunt for the little girl. A week after the disappearance of Paulette, it was announced that her parents and nannies were taken into custody. The first suspect identified in the case was Lizette. The stories which Paulette's parents and the nannies shared had inconsistencies, and the media and public began to become suspicious. This is when a shocking revelation came to light. According to a Mexican news report, Zocalo, there were some undercover recordings of Paulette's parents and their other daughter found. This contained a conversation that sounded like Lizette, how her daughter not to admit anything to the investigators, otherwise, she'd get in trouble. Was she responsible for the disappearance of Paulette? However, Lizette claimed she was taken out of context. Both of Paulette's nannies, Erica and Martha Casimiro, claimed that the girl's parents seemed unconcerned while everyone was frantically searching for her. Even Lizette's media appearances made people uncomfortable. Her cold nature made people wonder if she was the one responsible for the death of her daughter. It was revealed that Lizette could have had a personality or mental disorder. According to Sandra Adam, a legal psychiatric expert working with investigators, Lizette has always remained very distant in matters of affection and emotional attachment. In short, some characteristics pointed toward a mental disorder. A further twist in this story was that when Paulette, 
who had gone missing for nine days, was somehow found in the same bedroom in which she was sleeping before her disappearance. An officer in the case caught a whiff of a putrid smell. This led him to find where Paulette, the very bed from which she disappeared. On March 31, 2010, Paulette's body was finally found. It was a bizarre finding as she was tucked away at the foot of the bed. The autopsy, as reported by CNN, ruled that Paulette's death was an accident. As it was reported that she had seemingly rolled to the foot of the bed and accidentally fell and lost herself in the gap between the mattress and footboard. She then suffocated to death. According to reports at the time, the autopsy showed that Paulette died via asphyxiation that obstructed the respiratory airways and compressed the abdominal thorax. There were no drugs or toxic substances found in her body or any signs of physical abuse. According to the San Diego Union Tribune, moreover, as Buzz believed that Paulette's body hadn't been moved. The position the child was in when she was found was the same as the position she was when she died. That is the original and final position is the same. He claimed in the Union Tribune, but conspiracy theories around Paulette's cause of death still abound. Someone noticed a pair of pajamas on top of the bed while Lizette was giving a TV interview before Paulette was found. When Paulette was discovered, she was wearing those same pajamas. It could be true that the girl had multiple pairs of the same pajamas, but the coincidence was still eerie. Conspiracy theorists, however, focused on how everyone managed to miss where Paulette's body was for nine long days. The police even brought in search dogs at one point. BBC reported that over 100 people had been in her room, searching for her. More disturbingly, friends and family had slept in her bed during that period, per the Union Tribune's report, and didn't notice anything. The only explanation given was that there was enough bedding and blankets to mask the smell of the decomposing body for nine days. But the nannies were adamant that they would have noticed disheveled bedding or any kind of evidence that the child had fallen in between the bed and frame. The public found it hard to believe that authorities had investigated Paulette's room multiple times and came up with nothing. Many still believe that because of the negative publicity and Busby's initial inclination to point fingers at Lizette and Mauricio, the parents were possibly involved in their little girl's death somehow. Lizette and Mauricio ended up turning on each other publicly. According to Mauricio, he said, The only thing I can say is that for me, it wasn't an accident. I can only speak for myself. In a separate interview with Tala Visa, Lizette cried and said she didn't understand why her husband would be suspicious of her and claimed investigators had possibly manipulated him to turn on her. They have played a lot with their minds. Maybe he didn't have enough trust in me because I have never doubted him, Lizette claimed. What do you think of this little girl's death? This is the story of a sociopathic 16-year-old girl with an antisocial personality disorder who plotted the murder of her family with her teenage lover and later went on to have sex with her accomplice while her house burned down to ashes. The crime was so unimaginable and ugly that it shook the whole nation and every parent wanted to know what would make their children commit such a cruel act of violence. Erin Caffey, the daughter of Terry Caffey and Penny Caffey, came from a conservative and protective family. She had two little brothers, Matthew Caffey, 13 years old, and Tyler Caffey, 8 years old. Her family began homeschooling her when she was 13 after her family moved from Albuquerque, Texas, to Celeste, Texas, so that they could be closer to a conservative Baptist church where her parents worked as ministers while she sang in the choir. Her beautiful voice would sometimes move her audience and the church to tears. But for Erin, homeschooling was like an isolated existence for an otherwise social girl. She reportedly didn't have many friends, and her life was largely confined to the church and her parents' house, which she later tried to burn down. When Erin turned 16 in July 2007, she was allowed to work at the local Sonic. One of her co-workers observed that she was so sheltered, it was like she was seeing the world for the first time, and that was where she met her soon-to-be boyfriend, 18-year-old Charlie Wilkinson. He was a high school senior and known as hot-tempered, but he had never been arrested previously and had no serious discipline problems at school. This was the first pivotal moment in her life. The kind and sweet Aaron that her family and friends had known and loved so much slowly went away. Nobody knew it yet, but at that moment, other lives were changed forever. However, Aaron's parents did not approve of Charlie. He had given them an impression of a rude, arrogant, full 18-year-old. 
although it's up for debate that these traits might have been more Aaron rather than Charlie. As time went on, Aaron and Charlie's relationship grew intense and more passionate. They didn't care what anybody else thought in regards to their relationship. They started spending more and more time together. It was almost like they became parts of each other. In fact, they had only been dating for a few months when Charlie presented Aaron with his grandmother's engagement ring. You know how it is to be young and in love. Your brain gets foggy. All common sense goes out of the window, and sometimes it's hard to see what is so clear to everyone else around you. As Aaron began to shut off everyone from her life except Charlie, secluded herself from the rest of the church, and started to engage in inappropriate PDA, her parents also began picking these changes in her behavior. This absolutely infuriated Terry and Penny. And from then on, the Caffies limited Aaron's time with Charlie to once a week, in their home and under their watch. Charlie had to leave home by 9 p.m., and Aaron could use her cell phone to talk to him only until 10 p.m. These restrictions made Aaron very furious, and she planned to run away with Charlie. In February, Aaron was grounded for talking to Charlie without permission and got her keys and phone taken away. Eventually, it all became clear to her parents that this relationship will continue to cause problems as long as it will go on. Penny put her foot down and asked Aaron to stop seeing Charlie. Allegedly, this was the moment when she decided that drastic steps were needed to be taken so that she and Charlie could finally be together with nobody around to disrupt them. Maybe this was the moment when seeds of a highly dangerous idea had taken root in Aaron's mind, and her parents, unaware of all these barbaric ideas that were making a home in Aaron's consciousness. Terry and Penny thought that with the imposition of grounding restrictions and ending their relationship, they had fulfilled their parental responsibilities. But they had no idea they were totally ignoring Aaron's increasing obsessive antisocial behavior and what it was going to lead to. And so came the early morning of March 1, 2008, when the Caffey family could not see the sunrise. It was 2 a.m. in the morning when a loud bang of their bedroom door opening woke up Terry and Penny. The two little kids, Matthew and Tyler, were asleep in the rooms upstairs. The two intruders burst into the couple's bedroom and opened fire, shooting them several times. Bullets showered the bedroom, and before Terry and Penny could make out what was happening, they were shot multiple times on their bodies. It was a horror that they had not even thought of in their lives. To save Penny from the shots, Terry jumped on her and took two bullets straight on his face. Not only did they break and start shooting hysterically, but they also came in carrying two samurai-style swords. After Terry took blows on his face, he flung out of the bed, and the intruder shot Penny several times more. Then they shot Terry three more times in the back and once in the back of the leg. All in all, Terry took 11 shots on his body. Terry could not feel the right side of his body, and even when he tried to speak, nothing came out of his mouth. Then one of the killers took a sword and stabbed Penny in the neck, nearly decapitating her. This is the harrowing account of Terry Caffey's experience as he faced a horrific attack on his family. Terry began to panic as he thought of his children who were asleep, knowing that they would wake up to a nightmare. His attempt to get up was thwarted when he heard his son Matthew cry out, pleading with someone named Charlie. It was revealed that Aaron's boyfriend, Charlie, along with his friend Charles Wade, was attempting to murder the entire family. Upon hearing Charlie's name mentioned by Matthew, Terry realized who was in the house and why. A gunshot rang out, and Terry, trying to get up, collapsed as blood rushed to his head. Matthew had been shot dead, and Tyler, the other son, rushed and hid in the closet. Wade found him, and both assailants took turns stabbing Tyler to death. Once they were sure they had killed everyone, Charlie and Wade set the house on fire with pocket lighters and fled the scene, leaving behind a horrific sight of a slaughtered family and a burning house. Despite the assailant's intentions for the entire family to die, Terry miraculously survived. He managed to crawl through the woods to a neighbor's house roughly two hours after the attack. When the neighbor, Tommy Gaston, called 911, Terry, bleeding from various wounds, was taken to East Texas Medical Center in Tyler and admitted to the critical care unit. In the ambulance, Terry named his daughter's boyfriend, Charlie Wilkinson, as the killer. Chief Deputy Commissioner Kurt Fisher realized that Charlie was a friend of his son and had even gone fishing and four-wheeling with him many times before. Fisher spotted Charlie's car parked outside Matthew Wade's trailer, the brother of Charlie's accomplice, Charles Wade. The detectives rushed to Matthew Wade's trailer, 
where they encountered a teenager named Grugly. As the officers entered the trailer, they discovered Wade and his girlfriend, both of whom were woken up by the officers. Fisher informed them that he needed to talk to Charlie Wilkinson. During the search, they found Charlie lying on a mattress, wearing only blue jeans, with a semi-automatic handgun on the floor beside him. Charlie was taken outside in handcuffs, and Fisher asked him about the attack. Charlie denied involvement, claiming he got drunk the night before and passed out. Upon further investigation, the officers found evidence linking Charlie to the crime scene, including blood-spattered clothing. Charlie was brought to the county jail, where he hung his head in silence. Fisher questioned him about his involvement, and Charlie maintained his innocence, asserting that he got drunk and passed out. The story continued to unfold, revealing that Aaron, initially claiming to be drugged, had lied about the events of that night. Despite her father's belief that Charlie sought revenge, Charlie's version of the story differed, stating that he did it for love rather than rage. As the investigation progressed, Charlie eventually disclosed his accomplice's names. Charles Wade and his girlfriend, Bobby Johnson, were promised $2,000 by Aaron within 24 hours. All four suspects, Charlie Wilkinson, Charles Wade, Aaron Cathy, and Wade's girlfriend, Bobby Johnson, were in police custody, and they were all talking. According to the boys, Bobby drove Charlie, Aaron, and Wade to Kathy's home. They wandered around the house for a long time before being scared away by the house's dog, which immediately started barking loudly. Aaron repeatedly called Charlie, forcing him to come back and kill his parents. She said she would bring the dog inside so it wouldn't wake anyone up. But as the boys hesitated, Aaron, in her pajamas, convinced them to continue. Bobby drove them to a cemetery where they sat for an hour and planned the murder of the Kathy family. Charlie tried to convince Aaron to run with him, but she insisted on permanently getting rid of them. Not just her parents, she wanted her little brothers killed too. As she put it, they were annoying. They drove back to the house again. This time, Aaron took care of the dog and sat in the car with Bobby outside the house, while her friends carried out the murder of her family inside. Once Aaron confirmed that her parents were gone, she gave Bobby and weighed the combination to the lockbox in which the money was kept. They also took $400 from Terry and Penny's wallets. As the plan was being executed, Aaron's words were, holy shit, that was awesome. She celebrated the death of her family by sleeping with their killer the same night. Aaron was under arrest but denied plotting the murder. She couldn't be questioned immediately as she was a minor and she didn't agree to speak with investigators. So she wrote a statement claiming that she was forced by her boyfriend into this act, and she was just going along with it. Erin was sent to a juvenile detention center where she was held on murder charges. On January 2, 2009, she was sentenced to two life sentences plus 25 years for capital murder. Charlie and Wade were sentenced to life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. Bobby, on the other hand, was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Terry Cathy, the only member of the Cathy family who survived that night except for Aaron, still visits his daughter's jail and fights for her early release. To this date, he cannot believe that his daughter could do such a thing, maybe because during those jail visits, Aaron has told him a different story of her innocence. Terry later went on to remarry and now has one more biological child and three adopted children. He even wrote a book on the horrors of that night, it's called The Terror by Night, The True Story. Aaron's case is no less than an alarm for mental health issues among teenagers, and this case goes to the extremes of it. Aaron showed extreme signs of antisocial personality disorder during all those years of her relationship with Charlie, but her parents didn't seem to notice the severity of symptoms. What do you guys think? Was this a case of bad parenting? A teenage romance gone wrong, or a sociopath manipulating her boyfriend for her evil desires? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. The Lynn Family Murder The Lynn family lived in North Epping, New South Wales, Australia, and they were a proud family who had their needs met. The husband, Min Lynn, and his wife, Lily Lynn, ran a successful family-owned newsagent in Sydney. Min and Lily had three children, June Brenda, who was 15, Henry, who was 12, and Terry, who was 9. The Lynn family also had Lily's sister, Irene, living with the family. The family had a cordial relationship where everyone openly expressed whatever was on their mind. It was a family with no secrecy as they lived and worked together. 
Things were all smooth and rosy for the Lin family before something unexpected happened, which ruined the family forever. During the early hours of one Saturday morning in July 2009, when the busy shop of Lin's family didn't open for business, it was odd for almost everyone who knew the shop. However, Kathy, who was also Lily's sister and happened to work in the news agency, began to receive calls from curious customers about why the shop was locked. Upon hearing the situation, Kathy began to suspect something wasn't right with the shop being locked. This prompted Kathy and her husband, Robert Shee, to go check the home of Min and Lily. As they arrived at the Lin family residence in the quiet suburb of North Epping, the front door, which was usually locked, was unlocked. Kathy was beginning to feel frightened about the development. As she and her husband took steps forward, they could see sprinkles of blood here and there. They took a bold decision to be sure of whatever was happening or might have happened. They went upstairs to the bedroom, and what she found next was a horrifying scene that kept her shivering for some minutes. Both Min and Lily were drenched in a pool of blood, bludgeoned to death by a weapon later described as hammer-like. In the next room, they found Kathy and Lily's sister, Irene, with the same awful fate. Both Henry and Terry, Lily's young sons of 12 and 9 years old, were not spared either of this gruesome attack. They too were brutally murdered similarly to every other person in the house, in their bedroom. Blood splattered all over the walls of Lynn's house suggested that a great struggle had taken place before the gruesome attack. Kathy placed a call to the local police, informing them about the gruesome situation at the residence of the Lynn's. She could not utter her words fluently as she was shivering about her extended family who had just been horrifically murdered. The situation had a little twist here. Brenda, who was the only member of the Lynn's family, was spared as she was away on a school excursion in New Caledonia at the time of the gruesome attack. Brenda is still on the school excursion when she learned about the gruesome killing of her family through Facebook. The police and paramedics did arrive at the scene, but it was so gruesome that they had to implore forensic analysts to help identify the members since the faces of the family were beyond recognition. They later concluded that the weapon that was used was likely to be a hammer. It only went from bad to worse as Brenda and the extended family had to live with a new harsh reality. Days after the incident, Kathy and her husband were finally composed enough to make emotional public pleas. Calling for support to help solve the murders, Brenda, the only daughter and sole surviving child of Lynn from the gruesome attack, went on to live with the Shays. They initiated the idea for her to come live with them and be a part of their new family, as she had no other place to go at the time. However, the lack of strong leads, as well as the nature of the vicious attack, suggested a more personal motive than a simple burglary gone wrong. The authorities turned to family members and possible connections for their investigation. Robert Shi, a former ear, nose, and throat specialist in China before moving to Melbourne in 2006, was one of the early suspects, as many indications pointed to him. According to the Daily Telegraph, he had opened a restaurant in Melbourne, but when his new venture soon failed, he and his wife, Kathy, moved to Sydney and had been unemployed ever since. Various reports also suggested that he was close to his extended family. It would take over a year for any breakthrough evidence to surface. During a forensic examination of Xi's garage in May 2010, experts found a tiny stain on the floor of the unkempt garage known as TY91. According to the Australian, one of the forensic experts trained in blood tain pattern analysis was convinced that TY91 looked like a transfer stain, the kind produced from coming into contact with an object such as clothing, a weapon, or a bag what with blood. Lab tests, however, proved that the tiny mark was consistent with the DNA of the Lin family members. She was subsequently arrested in May 2011, while his wife Kathy maintained his innocence. As all these new developments were happening, Brenda was still living with her new family. It took four trials spanning over seven and a half years before he was convicted. The first trial was aborted when a possible sexual motive emerged, but the court refused to identify the victim as she was still a minor at that point. She later opened up on how Robert has been sexually assaulting her in her home while her parents were still alive, and how he continued to assault her after Kathy and Robert took her in as a new family. The second trial was halted when the judge fell ill, while the third trial ended in the hung jury. Finally, in 2017, she was found guilty of murder. After the verdict was announced, she proclaimed, I did not murder the Lynn family. 
I am innocent. In a recount by Brenda, the only surviving child of the gruesome incident that claimed. The lives of the Lynn family she said that it was 2009, and the high school student was. Preparing to fly to New California for an excursion. And looked around a departure gate to see her classmates kissing their families. Goodbye. Being a prideful teenager, I did not say anything to my father. I just stood there awkwardly and thought to myself, it's just going to be a week I am. Going to see them again really soon. Miss Lynn, now in her 20s, told the sentencing hearing for her uncle Robert she last. Week. But while she was overseas, she murdered her entire family. Her father, Min, Norman Lynn, her mother Unlai Lily Lynn, her aunt Yoon Bin Irene Lynn, and her two little brothers Henry and Terry in the bedrooms of their North Epping home. On July 18, 2009, to this day, my biggest regret was not hugging my father and telling him I loved him too. Say thank you for being an amazingly loving and caring parent. This is a story of love gone bad. Ryan Poston was born on December 30, 1982, in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, to Lisa Carter and Jay Poston. He had three younger sisters, Allison, Catherine, and Elizabeth Carter. He attended the International School Manila in the Philippines and the International School of Geneva in Switzerland during high school. Later, he attended Anna University, where he tripled majored in history, geography, and political science, then went to school at the Salmon P. Chase College of Law, Northern Kentucky University, and Highland Heights. Poston was a promising American attorney working in Cincinnati, Ohio, and was 28 years old when he met his post lover. While his lover, Shane, and Michelle Ubersa was born on April 8, 1991, in Lexington, Kentucky, United States, she was 19 years old when they met. Ubers was a student at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, majoring in psychology. In 2011, Shana Ubers and Ryan Poston met on Meta, formerly known as Facebook. Poston stumbled upon a beautiful profile picture of Ubers on his mobile phone while surfing the social site. He was intrigued by Uber's beauty, prompting him to further check her profile. Poston was sure he wanted to be more than a friend to the person he had seen in the picture. He sent her a friend request. The duo began talking, and things were going smoothly with their conversation. During their talking stages, there were arguments, but that didn't put off a relationship, as the duo were so attached to one another. The reality between the duo differed from what had appeared to the public. However, the two shared an on-again, off-again romance for 18 months, often arguing over trivial matters. Poston and Ubers' on-off relationship was noticed by friends of the duo, which helped in figuring out what transpired when things got out of hand. Something bizarre happened, which turned a supposed beautiful evening into a morning evening. During the recount of Ubers before the major incident that happened in the story, she claimed on October 12, 2012, she was in the condo over lover ex-lover Poston. The duo was reported to have ended the relationship between them before the aforementioned date. On the said date, her ex-lover had a date with Miss Ohio USA 2012 Audrey Bolt that evening. Ubers, at some point, had claimed her relationship with Poston was abusive, and that was one of the main reasons the relationship with him didn't work out. On the evening Poston was to have a date with Miss Ohio USA 2012, things went sour with him and Ubers, his ex-girlfriend. In the pace of the evening, Ubers claimed Poston was calling her mother stupid and crazy. She further said he called her unstable and deranged, which triggered her, and she decided to leave his condo. But things didn't go as planned as he came for her as she approached the exit of the condo. Ubers said Poston grabbed onto her body, onto her person, with both hands. She claimed he had picked her up from an awkward angle in the house and threw her from the doorway of his bedroom into the other room to the edge of the short sofa. The ensuing struggle, Ubers said, Poston fell on her and pinned her against a footstool, thereby grabbing her hair and screaming in her left ear. She thought he was going to snap her neck because of the way he was jerking her head around. Ubers claimed all of his weight was on her at this point, and there was no way for her to escape for her life. In a further recount by Ubers, she claimed Poston had pushed her again the TV in his room, but during the investigation of the crime scene, the TV set was in perfect condition which contradicted her story, to get herself free from the pinning weight Poston had on her. She claimed to have punched him with the right arm. And when she did, it knocked the glasses off his face. She could get herself free, 
and the duo wrestled standing up. Ubers during her trial, recounts said. The four things got Messier. Poston was standing over her and grabbed the gun that was sitting on the table and pointing it at her, saying, I could just kill you right now and get away with it. Nobody would even know. She said she was shocked and afraid at the same time. This pipe Poston's words, he didn't shoot. Instead, he set the gun back on a table and continued to yell hurtful things at her. She was losing it, and to defend herself against Poston, she shot him six times. But what the investigator discovered was something that would leave you wondering what could have transpired between the two that evening. After Ubers had shot her ex-lover six times, she called the police immediately to report what had happened. She dialed 911 and told them she shot him in self-defense. After the initial report, she continued to tell the dispatcher that because he was twitching, and I knew he was going to die anyway, and he was making funny noises, I shot him a couple more times. Uber said he was twitching so badly, and I didn't want to watch him lay there and twitch. Police on the crime scene searched and recorded all information that could help with their investigation in the case. However, what Ubers had told the investigators was contradicting everything that was in the condo of Poston, which led the police to suspect Ubers murdered sitting in cold blood. Police brought Ubers to the police station for further questioning and interrogation. Officer Dave Fornash was the officer who interrogated her. She initially stated that she wanted an attorney but began to share details of the murder with him. During an interview with police, she said she knew Poston would die or be seriously injured. This was referred to according to a clip that emerged from her trial. Officer 4 stated Ubers appeared unremorseful during a recount of the ugly incident and made several morbid jokes about the murder, including telling officers, I shot him right there, pointing to her nose. I gave him the nose job, which he had wanted. After the back and forth between the interrogator and Hubris, he left the interrogation room, and Hubris' behavior got stranger at this point. As she danced around the room, singing aloud and snapping her fingers as if she had just won a huge sum of money from a lottery. With all of Uber's actions and what she had recounted, it was evident that she had an active motive for killing Poston, which the police couldn't find out. However, most people who had weighed in on this case believe Ubers hadn't originally killed her ex-boyfriend for letting go of her and having a date with Miss Ohio USA. In April 2015, Ubers claimed Poston was violent toward her while the prosecution countered all she had to say with evidence that what she was saying was the opposite of what had happened. At some point, the prosecutor said that she was obsessed with the attorney. As the investigation revealed, she was sending about 50 to 100 texts per day sometimes to her ex-boyfriend. During the back and forth, the jury concluded and sent her to 40 years in prison for Poston's murder. She appealed, and her sentence was overturned the following year because it was revealed a convicted felon had served on the jury, which is not allowed by Kentucky law. While she was still in prison awaiting a conclusion to the case, Ubers was granted a second trial. Nivens and other former cellmates testified about her behavior behind bars and what she allegedly told them about Poston and his killing. One inmate, Cicely Miller, discusses Hubert's behavior after being arrested and how she never pressed remorse about killing her boyfriend. During Shane Uber's second trial in 2018, Tech the then 21-year-old center of France before she murdered Ryan Poston seemed to display an escalation and violent ID one that by all appearances went virtually unnoticed at the time. The prosecution brought forward witnesses who testified that Uber sent them a text message, joking that you wanted to accidentally shoot Poston at a gun range. Another witness testified that she had heard Ubers telling a co-worker that she was going to kill her boyfriend. Some texts read, When I go to the shooting range with Ryan tonight, I want to turn around, shoot and kill him, and play like it's an accident, read the text, which was received by Uber's friend Christy Euler. Another one described Uber's growing rage at Poston, with Uber's state belief in a thin line between love and hate, and that her love for Poston had turned into hate. Toward the end of their relationship, Shauna Uber's had conducted many internet searches for a woman, which her ex-boyfriend had fronted on Facebook in January 2012 named Adri Belt. Belt, who was named Ms. Ohio USA the same year, eventually agreed to meet up for a date with Poston, having ended things with Hubers at that time. In an interview with a local Kentucky station via CBS, Bolt recalled her impression of Poston. He was very funny and very smart, and I found him very entertaining, 
and that led me to accept an invitation to go on a date with him. She recalled, Poston, it seemed, was also as excited and enthusiastic about the proposed date, but he reportedly told his stepfather, Peter Carter, that he was struggling over how to tell Ubers about it, effectively putting the final nail in the coffin to their year and a half long relationship. I told them to make sure that he was kind to Shayna and that he told her honestly what was going on, said Carter at Hebrews second trial in 28 per CBS before recounting how Poston had also expressed worry that Ubers would ultimately sabotage Tajit describing her as always around. Tragically, Post would be murdered by Ubers only hours before he was due to meet Bold in person. A psychologist testified that she suffered from PTSD and borderline personality disorder and claimed the emotional abuse and distress caused by posting led to her violent act of murder. Ubers was convicted of murder again in 2018. This time on August 28, 2018, she was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2032. In her most recent mugshot taken in 2019, she is smiling. What do you think about this cold case? Let me have your thoughts or opinions in the comments section. Patricia Colombo Having been sentenced to 200 to 300 years in prison means a lot. And that is what this case is all about. 20-year-old Patricia had left her family home two years earlier to live with DeLuca, a 36-year-old married man. When Patricia was 16 years old, she worked in a suburban coffee shop where she met pharmacist Frank DeLuca, who managed the pharmacy next door to the coffee shop where she worked. DeLuca and Patricia developed some sort of chemistry, and with the duo, things led to another in which he hired her to work in a store, and the two began an unusual sexual relationship. Patricia showed classmates pictures of her having sex with DeLuca's dog. DeLuca and Patricia's relationship was growing so deep and out of hand at the same time, considering the fact that her lover was a married man, and the relationship was made public. In April 1974, DeLuca brought Patricia to stay in his own home, even though he still lived with his wife and five kids. However, she accepted to move into her lover's home, but she simply told her parents she was moving to her apartment. Her parents were relieved when she told them she was going to move into her apartment and not some random person's home, which prompted her parents to give her money for upkeep. Patricia wasn't able to keep up with the lies that she had told her parents, and soon they found out that DeLuca had left his wife and moved in with her daughter, prompting Patricia's father to beat DeLuca severely. The situation triggered some sort of hatred from the duo towards Columbus's family, which made them come up with a plan that changed things from bad to worse. On May 4, 1976, Patricia Colombo, who was 19 then, and Frank DeLuca, 39, decided to carry out a plan on Columbus's family after several deliberations on how to carry out the plan. The duo came up with a plan. The duo was ready to execute their much-deliberated plan. They observed the environment and later crept into the home of Columbus and shot every living creature found therein. On May 7, 1976, Chicago police found a car belonging to one Elk Grove resident, Frank Colombo, abandoned after apparently being stolen. The Chicago police informed counterparts in Elk Grove, however. The bodies of everyone killed weren't discovered until three days later on May 7 when a village police officer showed up to inform Frank that one of the family cars had been found in a poor black neighborhood on the city's west side. The responding officer who went to Frank Columbus's residence to inquire about the car noticed the front door ajar and delivered newspapers piled up on the front step of the otherwise immaculately landscaped home. The patrolman pushed open the door and saw Frank's bodies piled across the living room stairs with a piece of the bowling trophy sticking out of his gashed skull and immediately radioed for backup. Even though the family's car had been found miles away in Chicago, there were no indications that anything else in the house had been disturbed or taken. What he had seen was no ordinary crime. The Elk Grove community was thrown into confusion when the family was discovered dead. Police began investigation upon investigation to connect the dots of the murder, but there was no lead. Frank, 43 years old, who was the father, had been shot four times in the hat. Before he died, however, he had been cruelly tortured and beaten. Police reported he had been beaten with a bone trophy and the lamb so severely that the back of his head was disintegrated. There were several cigarette burns on his body, and he had also been stabbed in the throat and chest. His wife Mary, who was 41 years, was shot once between the eyes. 
It was reported that her throat had been slashed, and she also had been beaten, this time with a glass face. She was clad in a nightgown, and her underwear had been pulled down to her ankles. However, an autopsy later revealed there were no signs of sexual assault. Their son, Michael, who was 13 years old, was also killed. He had also been shot, beaten with a bowling trophy, and stabbed over 80 times, mostly in the neck with a pair of sewing scissors. There were indications that he had been sleeping when the attack occurred and was awakened and forced out of bed by his killers. The only surviving member of the family was the Columbus 19-year-old daughter, Patricia, who was living apart from her family with a 37-year-old co-worker, Frank DeLuca. Police questioned Patricia but had no reason to back her until the following week, as some of her behavior raised red flags to investigators. Ray Rose, the investigating detective, said that he has never forgotten what he saw that day. Evil, death, tragedy were his initial thoughts when he saw the carnage. What I saw was very curious. Rose saw the Sun-Times in May 2006. If you had just found out your whole family had been killed, you'd run to the scene. Patricia and DeLuca had initially wanted staged murders to make them look like mob hits or the work of black street gangs. Patricia went to the police stage and began suggesting possible motives and leads. One, which was quickly ruled out, was that Frank Columbus was the target of a mob hit. There was never any sign that he was in any way connected to organized crime. Lying to police in the course of a murder investigation is never a good idea. And when you're the sole surviving member of the family, it's an even worse decision. As a result of Patricia's statements and behavior after the crimes, Patricia Colombo became the chief suspect. In all bids to unravel the true case of the murder of Columbus's family, a hint came in. Inspired by the promise of reward money, a friend led police to the men who had discussed killing the Columbia family with Patricia. The detectives quickly established roles for themselves to make Patricia crack. Instead of good cop, bad cop, one detective described as looking like Tom Jones assumed the role of a boyfriend. At her family's wake and funeral, Patty flirted openly with the detective, to the point where her grieving relatives thought he was the displaced DeLuca, who had alienated her from her family. DeLuca's caught a notice in the corner of the funeral home. When Patricia wasn't joking, smoking, or flirting, she flung herself on top of her parents' and little brother's close caskets wailing with grief. After the couple was arrested, DeLuca's employees revealed that they had seen him wash and burn blood-stained clothes on the day after the murders. He had kept them silent by threatening their families. DeLuca attempted to have these witnesses killed by a cellmate, but another inmate thwarted the plan by telling the police. Ross, the investigating detective, chronicled how Columbus, the 19, plotted for eight months to kill her family, soliciting friends and acquaintances to carry out the murders. The investigating detective revealed that in December of 1975, Patricia met two men that she seduced and tried to hire to kill her family. Patricia claims one of the men forced her to have sex. She provided them with a diagram of the Columbus home and photos of the family. However, the men did not act on her request. And on May 4, 1976, she and Luca, her 37-year-old boyfriend, entered the home and attacked her family. During the course of interrogation, Patricia revealed that she wanted to beat her father to the punch, claiming she feared he had ordered a hit on her and her lover. Evidence revealed that the duo were willing participants in the murder, with Patricia acting as a decoy to be admitted to the house. When Frank Colombo opened the door and turned around, DeLuca entered and shot him with a 32 caliber handgun. During a detailed narration of how the incidents occurred, it was revealed that DeLuca, who did the shooting, shot Frank, who had been killed first as he tried to escape by running up the living room stairs. Patricia bludgeoned her father with a bully trophy. Mary was found cowering in the bathroom, her favorite room in the house where she had once lovingly hand-painted each bathroom tile with gold filigree. She had been shot dead center between the eyes. Patricia or DeLuca slit her throat just in case the bullet didn't take care of her. Although the Cook County Medical Examiner said that Mary was probably dead before she even hit the floor. The last victim was Michael, who had slept through the initial gunshots. The two woke Michael up and stood him upright, half asleep in his bedroom, while DeLuca shot him. Patty then stabbed Michael 87 times with her mother's sewing scissors. When police found Michael's body, they said at first glance, it looked as if Michael has had a case of the measles. 
until they realized that the measles were dozens of tiny red gashes. DeLuca admitted to shooting the victims. However, Columbus's date has not owned up to her part in the murder. A few days later, Patty was charged with three counts of first-degree premeditated murder. In detailed evidence tended to the court, the cops determined that Patricia had originally set out to hire him in, a couple of losers she met in a motel cocktail lounge, to murder her family. She had even gone so far as to draw a map of her parents' house, along with the warning that the family's white miniature poodle was a yapper. After the supposed hitman had strong Patty along, having sex with her and ripping her off of $2,000, Patty persuaded Aluka to help her carry out the job. Columbo and DeLuca were convicted of shooting her parents, Mary and Frank Columbo, and brother Michael and mutilating their bodies. They sentenced both to 200 to 300 years in prison for the murders and another 150 years each for conspiracy to commit murder. Columbo received an additional 50-year prison term for solicitation to commit murder. It all ended badly for the lovers who wanted to have it all at all costs. Like this video and subscribe to our channel.